Society, so I'd like to welcome you all to Regional History Day 2023. It's nice to see everybody back after a four-year hiatus. Uh, COVID, shut, COVID shut us down in 2020 and like the week of. Um, so a lot of the speakers today were speakers that were supposed to be here then, so we would like to thank them for all coming back, especially uh, Bob. Um, thank you all to uh, everybody that was involved in planning this, especially Elaine, uh, the uh, Kent County Library, and for um, them hosting us today and allowing us to use their space. Uh, we want to thank everybody that's here uh, presenting today as well. Um, just a few reminders before we get started. Uh, please silence your cell phones. Uh, make sure they're on quiet. I'm a teacher, so I know how that goes. <laughs> uh, restrooms are located in the hallways um, and also in the front. Um, <clears throat> make sure you save your door prizes. Those will be announced at 2 o'clock if you want to see what a door prize that you can win. That's on the Kent County Historical Society's uh, table. Uh, right as you come in the door, in the vendor room. Uh, hopefully everybody found the coffee and the, the snacks and the water, which is in the vendor's room. Uh, if you do partake in those, please make sure you just throw away your garbage so people aren't having to pick up after you. Um, lastly, I'd like to introduce uh, our Vice President of our Historical Society, Mr. Carl Litzenmeyer. Thank you very much. <coughs> Welcome one and all to the 2023 Northern Kentucky History Day. It has been two years since COVID-19 shut this event down and it was wonderful to be normal again. I hope you all <coughs> have chosen your presentation for each of the three sessions. Now I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker, my good friend and colleague, Robert Webster. Bob graduated from Holmes High School in 1981 and received a bachelor's degree from Moorhead. As president of the Kenton County Historical Society during that time, Bob began writing books on local history. First, there was The Balcony is Closed, a survey of neighborhood theaters that are gone. Then, Northern Kentucky Fires, a summary of the most memorable fires in this region. This book became very popular and brought out people connected with the former Beverly Hills Supper Club. They thought that the 1977 fire needed research, since many former employees felt their stories were ignored. After four years of work, many interviews and use of the Freedom of Information Act, Bob produced a definitive work on the arson cause of the Beverly Fire. This book is, to my mind, the single most important research our society ever produced. To illustrate Bob's tenacity, I have to bring up something. His research into, for example, Covington's Peaselburg neighborhood <clears throat> is a case in point. Raise your hands if you have heard the urban legend about it referring to goose dung. Uh-huh, okay, all right. And that's supposed to be a plot Deutsch word. That's what we think. But it certainly isn't Hochdeutsch because Gustav would simply be Gans Dungren. So that isn't it. So Bob con <coughs> contacted language departments in several European universities and found there is no such word. <laughs> Certainly none that means Gustav. He has put the urban legend to rest in that region we don't really know where that word comes from, and we are going to presume that it's an early family that left no record. So the residents can now cease to be embarrassed by the neighborhood's name because it isn't simply because there happen to be goose farms there that have no connection. So I, I, um, I'm 
just very, very impressed that Bob made the effort, and that's the way he is. Okay, today Bob will present his latest book, A Short History of Northern Kentucky. We local historians have often thought that <clears throat> those downstaters <clears throat> who have slighted us, for example, James Clover's definitive work, A New History of Kentucky, makes no mention of the Beverly Fire. Um, Bob has filled the local history void. I give you Bob Webster. Thank you. Uh, again, welcome. Uh, it is uh, truly an honor for me to speak to you today as a keynote. Uh, I've had the privilege of doing some of the breakout sessions over the years, but I uh, was just uh, thrilled to death when it was announced several years ago <laughs> that I would be the keynote speaker. Uh, of course, Carl has taken the first three slides off my uh, <laughs> But uh, we'll, we'll get through this anyway. Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> yes, my latest book is A Brief History of Northern Kentucky. Uh, I'm going to take uh, a little moment today and say, well, at least part of this is going to be the making of A Brief History of Northern Kentucky. Um, for me to cover uh, my book, we would need about three and a half, four hours, because we're, we're talking about millions of years of history. But um, he already uh, took care of this for me. Um, uh, my, uh, uh, I guess my greatest accomplishment has been uh, past president of the Kent County Historical Society for, for many years, probably too many to, uh, to mention. But uh, I started out thinking, why a new book? That was uh, the big question on my mind. And uh, because my wife knows how much money we make off those local history books. <laughs> but uh, I, I was, I'm, I'm working two full-time jobs and, and just had some spare time on my hands. <laughs> but why a new book? Well, as he said, uh, Northern Kentuckys are, Kentuckians are often left out of statewide issues. Uh, little interest from folks in Frankfurt. Uh, we, we seem to have more cooperation from uh, folks in uh, Hamilton County in Cincinnati, for instance, the I-71-75 bridge, uh, that's a, a collaboration between the two of them. We're considered South Cincinnati, as you well know, by many in the region. Um, when it comes to history, we are almost always uh, linked in with the history of Boonesboro, the Wilderness Road, and the rest of the state, which we should not be. We have our own history. I've been frustrated for years as I research uh, trying to find uh, good information uh, on other books that uh, have existed for years. Uh, the Encyclopedia of Northern Kentucky is, is, was well welcomed, welcomed, but it weighs about 30 pounds, so it's really not a, not a great read, but uh, a tremendous amount of great information in there. So I said, maybe we do need a new book, something just about Northern Kentucky. And uh, what I did, uh, before I really decided to, to, uh, to take the plunge was I made a list. And I, I wanted to put together 25 or 30 people, places, and events only important to Northern Kentuckians, such as James Taylor, the founder of Newport. We have uh, Thomas Kennedy, whose property became the city of Covington. I looked at Rabbit Hash General Store, which has been in operation since 1831. I looked at uh, the Cathedral Basilica, one of the most beautiful churches anywhere, as well as Banklet Creek, which is a major transportation route for early pioneers. I also included the Bulletsburg Baptist Church, which was organized in 1794 and is still in existence today. So I, I grabbed n uh, nine other books on Kentucky history. Um, a New History of Kentucky, a concise, I love that, a concise <laughs> history of Kentucky. <laughs> Kentucky Yesterday and Today, Thomas Clark's A History of Kentucky, the, Ency the Kentucky Encyclopedia, and many more. And not surprising to me, and probably not surprising to you, James Taylor had a short reference in two of those books, but it was after the War of 1812 and, and nothing to do with his founding of Newport. Thomas Kennedy was not mentioned in any of the books, nor was Rabbit Hatch, the Cathedral, Banklet Creek, Bulletsburg Baptist Church, and most upsetting, as Carl pointed out, 
Two of the books were released well after 1977, one, one calling it a concise history of Kentucky. And neither mentioned the Beverly Hills Supper Cup Flyer, a fire that killed 169 people and remains one of the worst disasters uh, in the Commonwealth today. Clearly, Northern Kentucky needed its own history book. Amen. Amen. Are we going to amen? <laughs> now, this certainly is a compilation. Um, multiple previously published articles and books uh, were studied and used. Uh, Northern Kentucky Heritage Magazine, if you are not a subscriber to that, please do so by the end of the day. Uh, the Encyclopedia of Northern Kentucky, as I mentioned, the history of Grant County, Boone County, from Mastodons to the Millennial, Campbell County, Kentucky, 200 years, Covington, Kentucky, the Gateway City, a centennial history of, North, of Erlanger, Kentucky, and many more. But it is also linked with a tremendous amount of brand new research. Uh, In-depth studies of current trends and vices, such as the heroin and opioid uh, epidemic and drug treatment centers, uh, the recent revitalization of the inner cities, uh, the explosion of downtown living by young professionals. And I've also tried very, very diligently to separate fact from fiction uh, uh, regarding previous research, uh, rewriting Christopher Gist um, stories and his travels, uh, for one uh, example, um, and defining the three L's that uh, represent the three L highway, which uh, had some some folklore as well. So there's a tremendous amount of, of new research as well. Is it complete and concise? Of course not. Uh, a concise history of Northern Kentucky would, would need to be a, a several thousand pages. <laughs> but it contains a tremendous amount of information uh, on the people and places and events uh, important to Northern Kentucky. I'd like to say it's uh, from the, it covers the upper 10 counties from before the Ohio River existed to the building of the Ark at Williamstown. So that is why there's a new book. Uh, so today I'm going to give a general overview of what is in the book. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, I can't, can't put it all in there. But uh, I hope that, you'll, that you, you would be impressed with uh, the amount of information that's in the book. I am quite sure I'm going to have someone, probably more than one, come and say, well, why did you put so-and-so in there? <laughs> why did you put... Well, we'll work on that. <laughs> So uh, before the Ohio River existed, uh, certainly the first chapter is a prehistory of the, the region. Uh, Pre-glacier information never before detailed in book form is included in this. Uh, Post-glacier animals, the ancient civilizations, um, and I, I've got in red here just to make mention, uh, if you are not aware, uh, there's a new historical highway marker uh, that uh, is uh, dedicated to the ancient civilizations that uh, were here in Northern Kentucky. It is located in Pioneer Park, uh, the south end of Pioneer Park, so you may, may want to check that out. Uh, the Taze River system is included, of course, uh, here long before the Ohio River existed, uh, before glacier activity. Uh, the ancient Kentucky River, ancient uh, Licking River, uh, is mentioned. And, uh, of course, uh, the after glacier activity that uh, brought about uh, the discovery of Big Bone, the birthplace of American vertebrae paleontology. Uh, most of you know, uh, because I think we're all history fans in here, that uh, those uh, massive herds of animals uh, are what uh, created uh, the, uh, through their yearly migration habits, uh, are what uh, created the, the uh, early uh, pathways and early uh, uh, ancient civilization pathways that led to the uh, creation of today's highways such as the US 25 and the Corsi 5. Uh, so those known migration trails uh, are detailed in the book, as well as uh, evidence of the ancient civilizations, uh, some scattered artifacts and, and uh, some burial mounds uh, that uh, are known to exist, and uh, a few that are still visible to uh, the uh, eye uh, and not hidden away. This is a burial mound uh, on uh, Route 11 in southeastern Mason County that uh, is still uh, easily visible. We have the early Northern Kentucky explorers. Uh, of course, some of you know the story of Dr. Thomas Walker, who apparently was the first European explorer in Kentucky. Of course, we know that's not true. The fact is there were several uh, French explorers who predate Walker by decades, Dutch and Spanish explorers as well. And uh, from my research, the earliest uh, seems to be Hernando de Soto, who was in parts of Kentucky as early as uh, May 1541. <coughs> 
So, sorry, Dr. Thomas Walker. Uh, Christopher Gist, for some unknown reason, Gist is noted in many early histories as the first European to explore what is now northern Kentucky uh, with the Ohio Land Company in 1750. Uh, authors claim he traveled down the Ohio River, camped at what is now Covington, visited Big Bone, explored the falls of the Ohio. Uh, simply not true. Uh, the fact is his journals are extremely detailed and fairly easy to follow for the most part. Uh, he was never a present-day Covington Big Bone or Louisville. Uh, again, based on my research, uh, what we know on the left, what we've been told uh, as far as the Big Bone story, uh, he writes when he was just west of present-day Portsmouth. He says, quote, here I met two men belonging to Robert Smith and one Hugh Crawford. They were returning from an area where, big, where large bones were found, and they gave me some of the bones. So in reality, uh, the bones were found by Robert Smith's men and given to Gist, who was nowhere near Big Bone at the time. And there's nothing in his journals to, uh, to suggest that he ever went there. Uh, as far as Covington, we've been told that he followed the Ohio River from Pittsburgh down to the mouth of the Licking. But in his journals, he clearly states that he went due west after leaving Pittsburgh into the Ohio country and entered Kentucky <coughs> at opposite uh, Portsmouth. So we hopefully clear that up a little bit. Uh, Mary Ingalls, <coughs> Draper Master, um, at Draper Meadows Master is uh, well detailed. And of course, if you don't know the story of Mary Ingalls, uh, don't buy the book. But uh, it's very important and uh, certainly uh, was worth uh, a couple of pages in, in my history. Uh, skirmishes with early Indians are actually included, including the attacks of Boonsboro and elsewhere. And you say, wait a minute, that's Central Kentucky, what's going on here? But I clearly described the main war path into Central Kentucky being that the Corsi Pike, Bowman Creek, and the South Fork of the Licking. That's extremely important to North Kentucky. Uh, Bryan Station, Hinkson Fort, again, those are Central Kentucky battles for the most part, including the Battle of Blue Licks, which again has been called the last battle of the Revolutionary War, which it was not. But uh, it's important to include that in my book because many of the early residents there became citizens of Northern Kentucky. Our earliest residents, um, James Taylor, Edmund Rittenhouse, who golfs at Dutch Windows, uh, Edmund Rittenhouse, uh, George Stockton, John Fleming, Jacob Fowler, nearly 30 others are mentioned, as well as some of the historic homes that are still standing. Uh, the Prettyman Mary uh, House, Abner Gaines, uh, William Arnold, nearly a dozen old houses in Old, Wood, uh, old Washington, uh, the Fowler Home uh, in Union. This is a sketch of Yakeman's Cove from Newport, uh, the early, uh, early description of uh, Lasanaville. But the first towns uh, in Kentucky, uh, Fort William, Kennedy's Ferry, Newport, Maysville. More early families are mentioned, and I won't read this list, but I, I tried to pay some tribute to uh, the early families that lived in the upper 10 counties. As far as the early 1800s, the Newport Barracks were built, uh, Lewis and Clark's expedition and uh, its importance uh, to northern Kentucky. Uh, the earthquakes in Kentucky from December 1811 to 1812 are mentioned, as well as a, a short excerpt from a letter that I uh, found uh, from someone's journals. Uh, this hit me hard, and maybe it won't uh, be the same to you, but you have to remember at this time, no one knew what an earthquake was. You had people in New York and Boston that maybe had read about some, something like that in the newspapers, but. For the people, uh, in, in, in this case, a little uh, southwest of Louisville, they had no idea what was going on. I'm going to read just a short passage. This is December 16, 1811. There was a great shaking of the earth this morning. Tables and chairs turned over and knocked around. All of us knocked out of our bed. The roar, I thought, would leave us deaf if we lived. It was not a storm. When you could hear anything, it was the screams of people and animals. When you could hold on to, you could not hold on to nothing for no man nor woman strong enough. When it got daybreak, you could see the damage done. We still had our home, had some damage. Those whose home was not built on built too strong did not. I made my mind to one thing. If this did not happen in the territory of Indiana, then me and my family is moving as soon as I find out. <laughs> and this went on for almost four months. But he writes on January 23rd, 1812, what are we going to do? We, you can't fight it because you don't know how. 
If, if it was a storm, you could see the dark clouds and know you might get strong winds. But this, you cannot see anything but a house that just lays in a pile on the ground, and trees that just fall over with the roots still attached. We lost our Amanda Jane in this one. A log fell on her. So this had to be absolutely terrifying for these people. But uh, after the War of 1812, Covington established uh, early primary roads become turnpikes, covered bridges are erected all over the place. I love this picture, uh, uh, bottom left, is uh, a toll road at Constance. So when the Kentucky welcomes industry, we have the Covington Cotton Factory, steam-driven sawmills in Newport, Maysville, and elsewhere. Slaughterhouses and breweries uh, become commonplace, as well as uh, the, the railroads coming through. So all of this is mentioned. Into the mid-1800s, mineral spas are the rage. Uh, Latonia Springs, Blue Lick Springs, Big Bone Lick, and elsewhere. Population in the region explodes, uh, mainly through German and Irish immigration. And we have the, the uh, wonderful Rabbit Hash General Store. Uh, Stephen Foster is mentioned, and I, I'm sorry, but uh, most of you are probably aware that new research indicates that he probably was never in the city of Bardstown. <laughs> if he had any inspiration at all, it was probably from Augusta, maybe Covington, but he's never been. <laughs> and one of my favorite finds, um, Gottfried Frankenstein, uh, I learned, was a uh, oil painting artist that uh, did some 26 paintings of the Bank Lick era, uh, area. And uh, I located this one uh, in the Cincinnati Art Museum. And if you study hard, I have to do this. Uh, Madison Pike in Fort Wright, the Animal Clinic. So that's right up here, just uh, north of the tank bus garage. Uh, the uh, golf driving range is right down here. <laughs> and we're looking north in 1851 along Madison Pike. I just find that fascinating. People say, well, gosh, I wish it was still like that today. <laughs> it, it may take you about eight hours to get to work. <laughs> it would be beautiful. <laughs> Uh, slavery, is, uh, of course, uh, included in the book, but it's our history, uh, not the history from uh, Central and Western Kentucky. Uh, the fact is, few slaves uh, were here compared to the rest of the state. Uh, of course, Mason uh, and Grant County uh, were more heavily populated. Uh, the slave auctions are mentioned, uh, however. Uh, most slave-owning families were in the western part of the state. Uh, our importance, of course, was the, the Underground Railroad, but again, uh, there's some facts that have been thrown around that needed to be disproved. Uh, seems that everyone along the uh, river in Covington had slave tunnels. Well, that, of course, is not true. Um, I like this one because I went to, to and graduated from Holmes High School, uh, and it was rumored for forever that there were slave tunnels under the Holmes Castle which, of course, was not even built until after the... <laughs> but anyway, um, of course, we know most uh, runaways found their freedom in Gallatin and Carroll and Mason County, Bracken counties. Uh, but a lot of the runaway slaves and their supporters are well detailed in, in the book. We, we take a couple of chapters to do that. Uh, the Margaret Garner uh, story uh, in that tragedy is, again, well defined. And uh, again, a little bit too to elaborate uh, to, to get into today. Uh, the Civil War, and uh, you know, the city of Cincinnati can, can certainly thank us for you know, protecting them. We have uh, maps of the various uh, batteries and, and forts that uh, were erected here, as well as the, uh, the skirmishes uh, that took place. Uh, and I know, uh, you know, I'm not going to elaborate and make this sound like a, a by Northern Kentucky skirmishes, we, we talked about a couple of rebels and a couple of Union soldiers that saw each other from a mile away and ran. <laughs> but how it got reported but it was another story. Uh, they did come through Crittenden along the Lexington Turnpike with plans to take Cincinnati. They made it to about 10 miles south of Covington. Uh, the skirmish at Snow's Pond uh, between Richwood and Walt was a little bit more elaborate. Uh, shots fired in downtown Florence. Uh, the September 15th uh, incident where rebels marched through Independence and met Union forces at what is now Old Madison Pike and Fowler Creek. Uh, and of course the battles at Augusta and Cynthiana are, 
they saw a much heavier action and are far more detailed, of course. After the Civil War, Northern Kentucky was still the most completely uh, segregated. Blacks were denied access to such places as parks, restaurant, lunch counters, public bathrooms. Uh, the 1874 legislator that, uh, legislation that uh, passed uh, some laws that uh, certainly helped. But in our case, uh, Jacob Price, uh, William Grant, Isaac Black, uh, uh, the colored schools that uh, opened throughout the, the 10 counties, uh, those are all well represented. Um, highlights uh, John Roebling's Suspension Bridge in 1866. Of course, it's been updated and reinforced over the years and still open to the public. Uh, important people and places in the late 1800s, uh, Daniel Carter Beer, who uh, helped found what uh, became the Boy Scouts of America. George Hill, Frank Dubinet, whose um, painting you see here. Uh, the Coppin Department Store Islands. Uh, industries such as rolling mills, uh, furniture factories, open throughout the region. We have the Latonia Racetrack, which opened in 1883. Uh, a lot of people are unaware that the Latonia Derby was bigger than the Kentucky Derby for many years. Known as one of the most beautiful racetracks. Um, between 1883 and 1927, when it closed, a total of 27 Derby, Kentucky Derby winners raced at Old Latonia, and it closed in 1939. Uh, the Ludlow Lagoon is uh, featured, of course. Opened in 1895. Uh, flooding, a tornado, prohibition, and a horrible accident on the motorcycle track they eventually closed the park in 1918. Closing out the century, uh, we have the bridge collapse over the Lincoln River, uh, the incredible Pearl, Pearl Bryan murder and decapitation. Uh, William Remke opens uh, what eventually became the region's first self service grocery. Uh, Jackson Florist is still open. Uh, George Wheelan is producing more beer than any other brewery south of the Ohio River. Uh, the early 1900s, we have the Donaldson Lithographic Company that opens, uh, printing colorful posters for the Ringling Brothers and others. The Benedictine Monks from Pennsylvania by the old Thompson Winery. And of course, I you know, cancel out the, the fact that uh, this is the smallest church in the world. It's, it's not, really not a church at all. But, its true history is included. Uh, the Cathedral Basilica, Dubu Park, uh, and Haven Gillespie. Who knows Haven Gillespie? Yeah. Oh, look, I love it. I love this place. <laughs> Santa Claus is coming to town. It's from coming to Early 1900s continued. We have the first moving pictures uh, shown in the region. Uh, ice and milk delivery, uh, bathing beaches in Dayton, Bellevue. The Dixie Terminal opens in Cincinnati. The early 1930s to 1940s, we have the infiltration of the mob in Covington and, and especially Newport. Uh, George Remus, Pete Schmidt, uh, Beverly Hills opens. Uh, the Cleveland Four is who I'm speaking of, but everyone has heard of the Primrose, Tropicana, Flamingo. Not uncommon at all to see Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis, Marilyn Monroe walking up and down Monument Street. So that was a wonderful time, we think. Uh, the flooding of 37, uh, of course, well uh, detailed in the book, uh, almost uh, several, uh, well, several pages anyway. Um, and most of you have seen some of these incredible pictures uh, and uh, some of the details that uh, are included. Uh, this is a shot of uh, Scott Boulevard uh, looking south at 7th Street. We have World War II, the Iwo Jima, and Pat Scott. Like, well, how does this all work together? Well, Fleming County's Franklin Salisley is included in the famous uh, picture that you see there. Uh, and then we have the uh, Girls All-American Professional Baseball League. Uh, if you've seen uh, the movie A League of Their Own, uh, Pat Scott was from uh, mainly Boone County, and she played for the Rockford Beaches. The automobile is introduced into the region, uh, movie theater in the region. <coughs> Uh, we have Alexandria Pike, Dixie Highway, the 3L Highway, gas stations, motels, restaurants, uh, erupting all through the, uh, the region from south of Covington uh, and, and, and Newport in every direction. Uh, pictures there of the Mariana and the Madison. Uh, the Denlu, uh, Schilling's Drive-In Motel Restaurant, the Cane Tuck <laughs> Restaurant, which has been gone now for many years. And of course, the Gourmet Strip, which most of you have heard of, uh, the, the many restaurants that uh, dotted Dixie Highway from Covington all the way to Williamstown. 
But within, uh, within a decade after I-75 opened, many of those were closed. Uh, civil rights movement and urban flight, uh, the 1950s marches and demonstrations, uh, did, uh, segregation, of course, being a, a major issue in especially public school systems. Um, urban flight seemed to go hand in hand. Uh, a national trend was already taking place before se desegregation uh, sent many families away. I said, well, how did it start locally? Uh, before 1955, everyone shopped at their neighborhood grocery, their neighborhood market, their neighborhood bakery. And in November 1955, the Newport Shopping Center opened. Uh, obviously an asset to most of the region, but immediately shops along Monument Street saw a decrease in business, a lost customer base that they never really reversed. And while the populations of Newport and Covington had grown steadily for decades, that trend stopped and eventually reversed by the mid-1960s and early 1970s. Well, we have interstate highways that made it easier than ever to live outside the downtown areas. Uh, businesses such as Penny's and Sears, uh, once in the core of town, moved out of town. Uh, even colleges and universities that were in town moved to the suburbs, as well as the neighborhood movie theaters. This added to the problem of inner city decay and poverty, an ongoing trend that cities like Covington and Newport are just now overcoming to some degree. The 70s also brought with it one of the nation's worst disasters, as mentioned, the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire, 169 dead, nearly 100 injured. Uh, a long list of new and revised building codes were at least one positive from the event. Brighter highlights of the 80s and beyond, uh, sports legends, Steve Coffin, Jim Bunning, Dave Justice, and uh, oh, many others are included in the book, as well as the actresses, actresses, uh, movies, um, Broadway uh, stars, singers uh, are mentioned. You've got the uh, Rain Man and George Clooney, Leroy Greens. We've got Kenny Price, Skeeter Davis, uh, Carly Pierce is even in the book. She's a new country singer that uh, is making it big. We have other tragedies uh, that are outlined in the book, uh, the Newport fireworks explosion, the Simon Kenton High School explosion, and the Carrollton bus uh, crash, uh, plane crashes as well. Uh, I detail the, the bowling alleys and roller rinks and, and some of the other recreational and entertainment uh, options that we had in, in those days. Uh, a few of those are still open, thank goodness. Can we get to the recent revitalization and development of some of the inner city towns? The uh, Newport on the Levee, uh, the Bavarian Brewery remodel, uh, South Shore condos, uh, the Boom Block, and, and many other things are featured as well. And I say that the book is up to date because I, I bring you up to the building of the Ark Encounter at Williamstown, now one of the region's busiest tourist attractions. I close out the book, though, with the fact that we still have a lot of old-time River City charm, uh, cities like Augusta, downtown Williamstown, Brooksville, Carrollton, uh, Flemingsburg, uh, even downtown, parts of downtown Florence still have that, and Maysville, of course, has that, that old River City charm, and, uh, and that tickles me, because that's, that's what I like as opposed to the urban city growth. But uh, that, folks, is a brief history of Northern Kentucky and how it came about. And again, I appreciate uh, everyone coming here today, and I give thanks to you, and I give thanks to the University Press for, uh, for publishing the book. That came out a couple of years ago. Uh, but I don't want to throw them under the bus, but this I have to tell you this story with my, the cover problems. I came up with this cover design. As you can see, I took that old picture, uh, the old painting of Godfrey Frankenstein, and I have a picture of uh, Covington's Riverfront, part of Northern Kentucky. So I go from old to new, and I thought that was just fabulous, and I sent that down to University Press, and they sent a, a remake, not uncommon. <laughs> they had the same exact design, but they had Cincinnati as this guy. <laughs> I blew up. <laughs> I typed up an email, and I showed it to my wife, and she said, oh my God, you cannot send that. <laughs> But I basically told them, listen, I'll, I'll find another publisher, but you have just proven my point. Uh, we're talking about a history of northern Kentucky, you want to put Cincinnati on? Well, it's just a more recognizable city. I said, well, so is New York, well, we just put New York on. But they 
ready. They said, okay, okay. We'll, go, we'll, we'll, we'll go with your design. <laughs> so uh, there's the book, uh, 325 pages, or, uh, six by nine, uh, over 50 photographs, uh, on sale for $30 out there. Um, I, I appreciate it very much. Um, the website also, uh, real easy to, to remember, it's bobtheauthor.com. <laughs> and uh, again, I really appreciate your time today. I hope you enjoyed the, the talk. Amen. Yeah.